Our first topic beyond review is waves. In John Coley's book, vibrations and waves are together in the same chapter. Vibrations, also known as oscillations or periodic motion, is the last topic that we cover in Physics 8. I think it doesn't hurt to do a little bit of review of vibrations and oscillations. One point here is that anytime you have something in stable equilibrium, you see if this marble tries to move away from its equilibrium point at the bottom. If it tries to move this way, gravity will push it back where it came from. If it tries to move this way, gravity will push it back where it came from. So if we displace it just a little bit, it will slosh back and forth. It's a sort of universal phenomenon that any time you have an object which is at a stable equilibrium point. If you were in Physics 8, or if you take Physics 8 next year, the whole point of what we do when analyzing the parts of a structure is to make sure each piece of the structure is in stable equilibrium. You can always displace an object with respect to its stable equilibrium point, and then it will undergo vibrations, oscillations, periodic motion, all names for the same thing, with respect to that point of stable equilibrium. When we build things, you want them to stay put. We put them in stable equilibrium. Anytime something is in stable equilibrium, a small displacement with respect to that equilibrium position will result in vibrations back and forth. And this is why vibrations are such a ubiquitous phenomenon. We're going to go on now and review our two favorite examples of vibrating systems. One of our two favorite oscillating systems is the mass hanging on the end of a spring. So usually the mass is also known as the bob. Here's a spring. We don't know the spring constant of this spring. If I put the mass on the spring, it's going to oscillate back and forth like this. Now if I take the same spring and I use a smaller mass, it will oscillate more quickly. And then an even smaller mass will oscillate even more quickly yet. The result that we found in physics 8 was that for mass on the end of a spring, the natural period of oscillation is 2 pi times the square root of the mass divided by the spring constant. The spring constant is measured in newtons per meter. Newtons are a unit of force, which is a unit of weight also. If we put a known weight at the end of this spring and we measure how many meters it extends from the relaxed length of the spring, we can divide those numbers and get the spring constant. Here's a one kilogram mass. That is 9.8 newtons, about 10 newtons, multiplying by the acceleration due to gravity. If you look where the bottom of this spring is now, and then you see what happens when I add the one kilogram mass, the spring became 15 centimeters longer. So each one of these stripes is 10 centimeters. So I measured out 15 centimeters longer. That gives us a spring constant about 65 newtons per meter. And now we can work out the natural period of oscillation. So that's 2 pi times the square root of the mass divided by the spring constant. For a 1 kilogram mass here, the natural period of oscillation should be 0.78 seconds. So if we let this thing bounce up and down 10 times, that should happen in 7.8 seconds. So let's see how well we did. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, we predicted 7.8, we got 8.0. Now if I do the same spring, so it's the same spring constant since it's the same spring, but I use a smaller mass. So this is a 500 gram, half a kilogram mass. So that's going to be, instead of 9.8 newtons of weight, that's going to be 4.9 newtons of weight. So now the period will be 2 pi times the square root of mass divided by spring constant. That works out to 0.55 seconds. So if we let this thing bounce 10 times, that should be 5.5 seconds. You can also notice that the spring extends less far. It should extend half as far, only 7.5 centimeters instead of 15 centimeters with half the weight on the end. So now let's see what happens when we let this bounce 10 times. 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five and a half. We predicted five and a half. The period we worked out was 0.55 seconds. Ten times we expected 5.5 seconds, so this time we were right on the money. If I do a 200 gram weight, that's 0.2 kilograms, you should see this go down only about 1.3, 1.4 centimeters. Won't go down much at all. Let's see if that seems about right. Yeah, it seems about right. So now it should oscillate even faster because that square root of the mass upstairs, which is giving us the period, is even smaller. It's 20% of what it was the first time, well, then the square root of that. So it's about something like 40% of what it was the first time. Let's count how fast this thing bounces up and down. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The number I worked out on the board was 0.35 seconds for the period. So 10 times should be three and a half seconds, 3.5 seconds, and we measure 3.7 seconds. Again, that's pretty decent. If we make the mass smaller, and that makes the oscillation period shorter, it makes the frequency, the frequency is the reciprocal of the period. Period is measured in seconds, frequency is measured in cycles per second. If we make the mass smaller, it makes the oscillation frequency faster, it makes the period of oscillation shorter. Now let's try varying the spring constant. The easiest way to see that these two spring constants are different is to attach the same mass to the two springs and see what happens. So here in each case is a 500 gram mass. So I'll attach it to our first spring and I'll attach it to our second spring. And this spring is much less stiff. A less stiff spring has a smaller spring constant. A smaller spring constant gives us a longer period of oscillation or a smaller frequency of oscillation. Here's the first spring we started out with. Here's a much less stiff spring. That period of oscillation has the spring stiffness, the spring constant downstairs. A less stiff spring means a longer period of oscillation. So let's see what happens when we start these two bobs on springs oscillating. So this one is much more slow than this one. So the period of oscillation is longer for the less stiff spring. Okay. Then we have another spring which is considerably stiffer than the original, and you can see that. So that's a kilogram, that's a kilogram, so it's the same. There's one kilogram here, one kilogram here, and I can make these two bounce up and down, oscillate. And the period of oscillation is going to be shorter for the stiffer spring. Frequency will be larger, period will be smaller for the stiffer spring. Oh. That's pretty good. Another thing I can do is I can put two kilograms at once on this spring. And then I'll put those same two kilograms on this spring. So the less stiff spring oscillates with a longer period, a smaller frequency. And I can go back now to the more stiff spring, and we're going to see a shorter period, a higher frequency. Good. And another thing to notice is that the period of oscillation is for natural free oscillation. You just bump it and let it go. So the period of oscillation is independent of the amplitude. We'll go back to our original. This is one kilogram on the first spring. So we predicted 0.78 seconds period to 7.8 seconds for 10 oscillations. So I'll try to make this go gently. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? So we predicted 7.8, we got 8.1. Now I'll try to make it go with a larger amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10. Okay, again, 8.1. So we changed the amplitude quite a bit and the period didn't change. So that's true as long as the system is linear in mathematical terms. So essentially that the spring constant doesn't change as you stretch the spring more or less. Sometimes in real life, if you stretch a spring a whole lot, the spring constant will change a little bit. But for, for relatively small oscillations, this is true. The period of oscillation is independent of the amplitude. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing now. First of our two favorite oscillating systems, the mass on the spring. We're going to do it with a much bigger spring. It's a garage door spring. That's a much stiffer spring. We're going to do it with a much bigger mass. The mass is going to be me. So I weigh 70 kilograms, just over 150 pounds. I have a, a helper here, the esteemed Bill Burner, our semi-retired demonstration guru. So here we go. I'm going to get up there and now this spring, when we stretch it, it's, it's kind of, see, so notice that it's all crunched together now. So I can't measure the spring constant by going from its completely relaxed position to stretched out because there's a, a nonlinear effect. So I'm going to get on the seat and then we're going to do a delta. We're going to add a 20 kilogram mass and see what the change in length is and then we'll subtract that 20 kilogram mass and we can use that delta L corresponding to that change in force to measure the spring constant. So here we go. We're gonna see how far the chair is off the ground when it's just me on the chair. And the number is 1.69 meters. And now I'm going to grab a 20 kilogram weight and we'll see how far down I go. 1.40 meters off the ground now. <laughs> it's almost 50 pounds. Whoa, all right. Okay, so we will work out later what our inferred spring constant is. So we know my mass, I'm 70.0 kilograms. I just stepped on the bathroom scale a moment ago. Now we have enough to calculate the spring constant. So now let's figure out the period of oscillation. So we'll do our usual trick where we'll count how long it takes to go 10 cycles. So I need to bounce a little bit. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that was 19.3 seconds for ten oscillations. Let's do it one more time, just to get another, another run here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, eighteen point nine. Let's see, let's try a very small amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, nineteen point seven. Okay, we can try a slightly larger amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so it seems like we saw no amplitude effect.
we expected a period of 2.02 seconds and we got a period of 1.97 seconds. I would call that pretty decent. The next of our favorite oscillating systems is the pendulum. So that's a bob on the end of a string. We treat the bob as if it's a concentrated mass all at one point. So that means the physical size of the bob is much smaller than the length of the string. And then there's some pivot point up here. Just barely visible on the board is that the period of a pendulum is 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by the gravitational acceleration near Earth. That's the familiar 9.8 meters per second squared. If you put in a length of 1.0 meters, you get a period of 2.0 seconds. If you put in a length of a quarter meter, 0.25 meters, you get a period of 1.0 seconds. And then in between, you can put in a length of a half meter, 0.5 meter, and you get a period of 1.4 seconds. I adjusted the string length here to be 25 centimeters, a quarter of a meter, 10, 20, 25. So now we expect the period of oscillation for this bob on the end of the string to be one second. So then if we let it go back and forth 10 times, we expect that to be 10 seconds. Okay, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, hey, pretty decent. All right, we predicted 10 seconds, we got 10.1 seconds. Let's try it with a slightly larger amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, pretty good. 10.4, we predicted 10. And then we can try it with a smaller amplitude. So the pendulum was one of the early examples of a, a clock you could use to tick out, you know, to measure things that are on the same order of magnitude as a human heartbeat, say. If you wanted to measure number of beats per minute, a pendulum is a pretty good low-tech stopwatch because all you need to know is the length of the string. Okay, small amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, again, pretty decent. We predicted 10 seconds, we got 9.8 seconds for the time it took to go back and forth 10 times. Let's try changing the length. Okay, of course this is a meter stick, so from the pivot point up here down to the bob should be five stripes. That seems quite plausible. We had a one second period at 0.25 meters, so at 0.5 meters we expect a 1.4 second period. That's basically the square root of two. So, let's time it again. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's do it again. Zero, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Cool, okay, so we predicted 10 times 1.4 seconds, 14 seconds for 10 oscillations. We got 14.3, good. Now I'm going to adjust this to one meter. We've adjusted this to a length of one meter. That's pretty good, should give us 2.0 seconds. Let's see what we get. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, pretty good. We predicted 2.0 times 10 is 20. We got 19.9. Science works. We could try it at smaller amplitude if we wanted. So here's a pretty teeny amplitude. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, again, pretty decent. You can see why Galileo loved the pendulum as a way of measuring short intervals of time. The other of our two favorite oscillating systems is the pendulum. So we tried some smaller pendulums earlier that were between a quarter of a meter and a meter long. Let's try a pendulum in this case that is 2.93 meters. We measured the height from the pivot down to the center of mass of the bowling ball. And it's about a 14 pound bowling ball, six kilograms. So let's figure out what we expect the period to be with a length of 2.93 meters, 3.44 seconds. Now let's count 10 oscillations back and forth of the bowling ball. Zero, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh, 34.5. Hey, that's decent. We were expecting 34.4. That's a little too good to be true. Okay, so that was pretty decent. Let's try the same thing at a higher amplitude. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, 34.5. So again, pretty darn close to our expected 3.44 times 10. Now, if you look at that expression for the period of a pendulum, 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by the gravitational constant, little g, there's no mass in there. And that's because the mass is the inertia in the problem, but the same mass also through the gravitational attraction between the bob and earth provides the restoring force. So the mass cancels out. So it shouldn't matter if I replace this, let's say 15, 14 pound bowling ball with a 150 pound person. So it's like a six and a half kilogram bowling ball. Let's say we replace it with, or maybe we add to it, supplement it with a 70 kilogram person. So let's try that. Now the one little detail is that this is a piece of rope. It's not really a extremely tense string. It's just kind of a rope. And I just measured a moment ago that it stretches by maybe about five or seven centimeters when I sit on it. That's not a big deal actually to bring that 2.93 meters up to 3.00 meters. So we could call it the same thing or we could do it exactly. So here I am as the bob. So instead of 14 pounds, we have 14 plus 150, 164 pounds or in kilograms, instead of about six and a half kilograms, we have about 76 and a half kilograms. So here we go. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten. Okay. Divide that by 10, you get 3.47. We predicted 3.44. It seems not to matter if the mass is about six and a half kilograms or is about 76 and a half kilograms. Nice. Let's just try the same thing at a much smaller amplitude. Zero. 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice, okay, so that's 3.49 per swing, dividing by 10. Again, that's pretty darn close to our prediction of 3.44. Good.